Hi everyone, this is part 2 of the Electronic Engineering Interview Questions video series. In this video, I'm going to discuss questions that you might get on transfer functions and body plots. Let's look at a typical question where you are asked to find the transfer function of the op-amp circuit here. I hope all of you are familiar with op-amps. I won't be covering op-amps on this video. You can find information on op-amps on the internet. Going back to the question, this was an actual problem that I was given on an interview a couple of years back. I did manage to solve it and uh, I'm going to work through this problem in this video. Questions on op-amp circuits are very common at electronic engineering interviews. So if you attend one of these interviews, it is almost certain that you will see questions on op-amps. I strongly encourage you to look up op-amps on textbooks if you're not familiar with them. Also look up how to derive the transfer function of simple op-amp circuits and how to plot Bode diagrams to predict the magnitude response and phase response. I've written down the values of the resistors and capacitors here. The values of the resistors R1 and R2 sets the gain of the op-amp circuit. This is the gain at the mid-band region or the flat region of the frequency response. Please note that this op-amp circuit configuration is non-inverting and the gain at the mid-band region is given by I hope most of you who are familiar with op-amp circuits know this formula by now. Some of you may ask, why aren't the capacitors in this equation? Well, that's because I've made some assumptions. You'll notice that C2 here is about 100,000 times smaller than C1. Therefore, at mid-band frequencies, C1 is a short and C2 is open. This is why there are no capacitors in this equation. This ratio, V out over V in, or the gain of this circuit, um, is an example of the transfer function of this circuit. But as I mentioned before, this equation for the gain is only valid at mid-band frequencies. We need to derive an equation or set of equations which will describe the behavior of this circuit at all frequencies. That is from low to mid-band and from mid-band to high frequencies. To be able to do that, we would need to include the reactances of the capacitors in the equations. When we do that, we will get an idea about the locations of the poles and zeros of this circuit. To make matters simple, we can denote the series impedance of R1 and C1 with Z1. Similarly, we can denote the parallel impedance of R2 and C2 with Z2. So the gain of the circuit now would be given by Now all we have to do is substitute the values of Z2 and Z1 in this equation and we would be able to derive the transfer function of this circuit which is valid for all frequencies. This is one way of deriving the transfer function of this type of op-amp circuits. But there is also another way 
to derive the transfer function. We can derive the transfer function of this circuit by taking advantage of the fact that C2 is much smaller than C1. Therefore, at low to mid band frequencies, we can replace C2 with an open circuit. So this is what the circuit looks like with C2 replaced by an open circuit. This should make our task of deriving the transfer function a little bit easier. I've written down the impedance of Z1 and Z2. Now, as I mentioned before, Z1 is the combined series impedance of R1 and C1. So it is given by this equation here. Whereas Z2 is the impedance uh, of the feedback network. And since C2 is not there anymore, Z2 is simply R2. So by substituting Z1 and Z2 in this equation, we get this expression here. Now, the numerator of this expression here will give us the location of the zero and the denominator of this expression will give us the location of the pole. If we substitute the values of R1, R2 and C1, we can find the location of the the pole and zero in this expression. I've already done that here. The value of the zero denoted by omega Z1 is 4.76 kilorad per second and the value of the pole denoted by WP1 is 100 kilorad per second. So by finding the location of the the pole and the zero, we now have an idea about the low frequency response of this circuit. If we were to plot the magnitude response of this circuit at low frequencies, it would look like this. So the x-axis is omega in rad per second and the y-axis is the magnitude in decibels. So the response would look like this. The zero, the location of the zero would be here. And the pole would be here. Now that we have found the location of the low frequency zero and pole from the, um, the circuit here, which is valid for low frequencies, um, we need to find out the location of the high frequency poles and zeros. In order to do that, we need to use the circuit which is valid for high frequencies. So this is the circuit which is valid for high frequencies. You will notice that C1 is not present anymore. It has been replaced with a short and C2 is back in the feedback network. That is C2 is in parallel with R2. Using the same procedure as before, we represent the parallel impedance of R2 and C2 with Z2 and Z1 is simply R1. We then substitute the expressions of Z1 and Z2 in this equation. 
in order to simplify our task later, we can rewrite this expression in terms of admittance. You should recall that admittance is the inverse of impedance. In order to write the transfer function of this circuit in terms of admittances, we use the following method. In the numerator, we write down the admittances connected between the input and the output. And in this case, it is y1 plus y2. y1 is the inverse of z1 and y2 is the inverse of z2. And in the denominator, we write down the admittance connected to the output node only. In this case, it is y2, which is the inverse of z2. So y1 equals to the inverse of z1 and y2 equals to the inverse of z2 that is Now all we do is substitute the values of y1 and y2 in this expression. We get this expression after substituting the values of y1 and y2. After a further simplification algebraically, we can write the transfer function in this form. From this expression, we can infer that there is a single zero and a single pole at high frequencies. By substituting the values of R1, R2 and C2, we can find the location of the zero and the pole. The expression for the zero denoted by omega z2 is given by this expression and by substituting the values of R1, R2 and C2, we can find the location of the zero Sorry, there has been a mistake. It should be 1.05 times 10 to the power 10 and not 8. And the location of the pole denoted by omega P2 is given by this expression. Um, and uh, by substituting the value of R2 and C2, we can find the value of this pole. Again, there has been a mistake. The, the value of the pole should be 5 times 10 to the power 8 and not 6. So now we know the location of the high frequency pole and 0. We also know the location of the low frequency pole and 0 and the mid band gain. So now we are ready to draw the magnitude response of the circuit, of the complete circuit. So this is the magnitude response of the complete circuit um, valid for all frequencies and this is the phase response. The plots of the magnitude response and the phase response are examples of Bode plots. If you are not familiar with Bode plots, I will strongly encourage you to look them up on a textbook. Find out how to plot Bode diagrams uh, for a given transfer function. I have deliberately tried not to be precise when drawing the, the Bode plots for the magnitude and phase response. That's because um, being precise is not a requirement in the interview. All you need to do is demonstrate that you can um, derive the transfer function and then from the transfer function plot the magnitude and the phase response of the circuit. 
So hopefully, by now it has become clear to you how by using circuits valid for low, mid band, and high frequencies separately, we can easily find out the magnitude response of a given circuit. With experience, you can derive the transfer function and the magnitude and phase response in one go. And if you can demonstrate that in an interview, that's even better. Being able to derive the transfer function of a given circuit and from the transfer function predict the magnitude and phase response is a very important skill that all electronic engineers should possess. If not during an interview, you will still be required to demonstrate this skill in your day-to-day -day job as an electronics engineer. I present more circuits to you for you to practice uh, deriving the transfer function and from the transfer function predict the magnitude and the phase response. These problems are all from past interviews. Have a go and I'll also strongly encourage you to simulate these circuits in SPICE. If you practice enough you will soon find out that you will be able to deduce the frequency response of these circuits just by inspection. And this is what experienced electronic engineers do. This concludes part 2 of the electronic engineering interview question video series. Thanks for watching.